Moira for inviting me. And I feel a very strange sensation standing on the platform where Lord David Alton stood. <laughs> so, um, after the Second Vatican Council, the a Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace was set up in Vatican first and then in dioceses across the world. In the UK, the very first one to be set up was in Leeds, and then the second one was in Liverpool. The one in Leeds closed briefly, so I'm now claiming very proudly that Liverpool is the longest, continuous Justice and Peace Commission in the UK. So a crowd for us. I don't know what they say about that in Leeds. Um, this afternoon, I want to talk about how justice and peace lead us to mercy. Right. I think justice and peace is a charism, which again is a word that David used earlier, and a charism is a gift or a grace that helps to bring our faith and our life together so that we don't have faith in one box and life in another. They need to mesh so that the way we live comes out of what we believe of, comes out of who we are. And I think that justice and peace is central to what it means to be church. Sister Bridget just told me that when the Carmelites were refounded by St. Teresa, one of the motivations for that was to work with the poor. I'd always thought the Carmel was refounded so that they would pray more efficiently <laughs> for longer or whatever, but it's out of concern for the poor. So it's unfortunate that a lot of justice and peace people have a bad reputation. We've got a reputation for being justice and misery. <laughs> for always knowing what's best and for always telling people what they ought to be doing. So I'm sorry if at the end of this 40 minutes, whatever, I leave you feeling miserable and disaffected. It's not the intention because justice and peace should bring us joy, should bring us happiness. Misery shouldn't be part of the deal. So if we start off by looking a little bit at the word peace, what do we mean? Well, it's a very disturbing word because peace not just the absence of war. Peace is present when people live in dignity. When everyone's got somewhere to live, enough to eat and drink, a job, family to live with, friends to go and see, things to do, maybe a garden to till, and football to watch even. Peace, it's our way of life. So it's not just about not being at war. I mean, there is a lot more to it, of course. But it's not enough to be a bystander and never get involved in things. That's not peaceful. It's not peaceful to watch people being abused and not say anything. We shouldn't refuse to challenge people who are saying outrageous things. Peace has to be defended. I mean, would it be peaceful to stand by and watch if somebody came smashing through those doors, started collecting people's handbags and possessions, this phone, <laughs> the equipment over there, bundled it all in a van and drove off? Would it be peaceful to say, well, I can't get involved? Well, it wouldn't, would it? And on the political stage, is it peaceful to defend human rights? Is it peaceful to organize a protest or a rally or to pick his factory, demand the right to work? There was a woman, a group of women from Liverpool several years ago who smashed the instrument panel of a Hawker Harrier jet that was going to be used to bomb East Timor. Was that a peaceful act? To everyone's amazement, a court in Liverpool found them not guilty. So these women are heroes of the peace movement. They ch 
challenge and manifest injustice? And would it be peaceful to protest against the replacement of tribes? Mm. I have a priest friend, Father Martin Newell, I don't know if you know him, he's a passionist, who chains himself regularly to the gates outside Badlet and gets arrested and sent to prison. Is he a peaceful man? Well, yes. But he's prepared to be counted, to stand up. And the estimates for how much it would cost to rebuild Triton range from 30 billion to 100 billion. And just numbers that are so big, it's hard to imagine. I find my own personal piece is based around the notion of what's enough being satisfied, because satis is the Latin for peace anyway, so to be satisfied and to know when you've had enough, those are, it's the same thing. But isn't it funny, in Ofsted terms, if the school is satisfactory, it actually means it's not good enough, which is <laughs> silly. So it's too easy to always want more of everything, more food, more drink, more red wine. That's last directed. Knows me quite well. <laughs> a bigger house, a new bathroom, another holiday, new car, more shoes, more, more, more of everything. How do we know when we've got enough? Ten days in the Holy Land, Palestine, going, staying with families, learning how to cook and being entertained. And that was the context in which they experienced the politics of Israel-Palestine. And Emma said she saw that written on the wall, the separation wall. So these words have such power. There will be no peace without justice. How can we be at peace when there is so much suffering in the world? My own peace depends on me living up to the call of being a peacemaker. And everyone in this room is called to be a peacemaker. Only a few, like David Alton, can work on the international stage. But there are people around here who are very influential on the local stage. I'm thinking somebody like Jane Corbett, Councillor Jane Corbett, and her husband, and <coughs> Father Arthur, Arthur Phipps, who are very influential on the local area. But all of us have had <coughs> relationships with our families and our friends and the people we meet. We're all called to be peacemakers amongst our own communities. And there is a beautiful prayer I don't know if you know Father Tom, Tom Cullinan. If you go to Mass at Tom's, this is the prayer that you always say before Mass. This is the penitential rite. So could we say that together? Lead us yes. from there to life, from also to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love. Use just 
context, I had to explain that I went to the church. That's a bit different. Not the gov- we're not the government. But the basic meaning of justice, I guess, is that people get what they deserve. That's a difficult one, isn't it? Just what do you deserve? I wouldn't like to be dealt with only on the basis of justice. But it's organised fairness, I think. Once upon a time, justice was o- only for the rich and powerful. In fact, the word dignity that we use referred to the ruling classes. They were dignitas, meant the rich people. But now we, we want it more widely spread. We all claim, quite rightly, we all claim dignity. We currently say human dignity, but maybe we're up to a stage where we need to spread the dignity around so it includes includes other living creatures. It includes the planet. So we treat the planet with respect. Anyway, more of that. So, a few different ways of using the word justice. This is justice before the law. Everyone's equal. The same justice for everyone. Social justice. Now this is the idea that everybody has a share in society. Nobody should be so poor that they they can't manage. And we apply that here. In West Everton community, WEC is a great example of search for social justice. But this social justice, hasn't it got to spread across the world? It's not just for us here. The big ask, justice. Distributive justice. That's the notion that how our wealth and power shed out. We can take these things for granted. But is it right that we can pass on our accumulated money to our children? I mean, it seems right, but who challenges that? What about people who didn't choose their parents carefully enough. I mean, Prince Charles did a great job on that. <laughs> oh. So it raises a really interesting question about what we do with wealth. And it's one of the reasons why there are different political parties, of course. Two other types, racial justice. Again, David Alton mentioned the abolition of slavery not actually being abolished, but we say that it's been abolished, a particular form of it's been abolished. I was in a, a conference in Leeds about a month ago, and a woman there from the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, a marvellous woman called Margaret Archer, said that there are six million trafficked people in the world today. Today. Not 200 years ago. And we say we've abolished slavery. And this Margaret Archer, she said that when I cross the courtyard in the morning and I meet Pope Francis, <laughs> can you imagine that? Every day she goes to work and she stops for a little chat with the Pope. And the Pope said, we've got to do something about this. So they went to the, the contact of the United Nations and said, we want to change we want to put something in the Millennium Development Goals. And they said back to her, no chance, you'd be lucky if you can change a comma. And then they had a conference. They called re- religious leaders of different faiths. And then they called Ban Ki-moon. And she said, one of the things you notice is that nobody refuses an invitation to go to the Vatican. So they all came. And there's a whole clause in the Millennium Development Goals combating the opposition to uh, trafficking put in entirely because the Catholic Church said it's got to go in. And I think that is an immense achievement. On gender bias, we're not so good. I do have no good news to report. Anyway. 
<laughs> but how is it that gender decides what role people have? That gender decides who has power and who doesn't have power? Now, that's justice, but there's books and books about this. So rather than get into a, any discussion about gender, justice, I've got four daughters. So we have four daughters, so I've been made alert to this. <laughs> Generational justice. What sort of a world are we going to leave for our children, our children's children? I read somewhere in a, a theological review for some strange reason I was reading, and there was an article in there that said the changes taking place in the oceans will take not 60 years to return to previous levels, but it might take a thousand years for the ocean temperature cool down to what it was, what it currently is. Because what we're getting now is a result of carbon emissions 60 years ago. So in another 60 years time, we'll be getting the ocean temperatures that our current level of carbon emissions is causing. And the notion that we are going to mess the world up and then leave it to our grandchildren and great-grandchildren and that is an issue of justice. Pretty much on the same theme, really. We now have the power to make the earth uninhabitable. Scary. Human beings have more control over the fate of the planet than at any time in the earth's history. I didn't want to make you feel miserable. <laughs> but we've caused climate change, rising sea levels, ruined forests, polluted rivers, the ocean full of plastics. The fish are now, have now got plastic. So we put plastic into the food chain. Not me personally, not you personally, but the culture that, lives, that allows us to have this level of comfort has done that. Now, our wonderful Pope, Pope Francis, brought out just over a year ago, Laudato Si, caring for our common home. And everyone was really excited, I'm still excited, that the Pope has said this is Catholic social teaching has a concern for environmental justice. But it's not new. Pope uh, St. Francis, he talked about Mother Earth and Sister Moon. And St. Bonaventure, one of St. Francis' companions, Francis of Assisi, St. Bonaventure said, there are two books of Revelation, the book of Scripture and the book of creation. I didn't know that until recently. So we read God in the world around us. So this concern for the environment goes back a long way. And just Two of the people who have been important in sort of kicking it into prominence in our church, it, the passionist Tom Berry. Have you ever come across Tom Berry? Yes. Absolutely brilliant. He's probably a, a devil to live with, but a brilliant mind and a brilliant analysis of what we've, we've done, are doing. And then there's the Columban, Sean McDonald. Mm -hmm. Now we had, you can't get Tom Berry because he died in. But Sean McDonough is still alive, and we've had him over here twice talking, you know, giving talks and explaining. He's a great fellow until he starts to sing. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do that, don't worry. So, eventually, the last Archbishop, Archbishop Patrick, used to say to me, because I would ask him questions to try and find out answers, he'd say, ah, yes, Steve, but what about God's justice? I just didn't know what he meant. But in the document that introduced the year of mercy, it says that. Faithful abandonment of oneself to God's will. And now there's a chance.
the next article, Article 21, he goes on to say that. God's justice is his mercy. Because if justice is what we deserve, mercy is what we need. abandonment to God's will it's a completely different change it's not about what we deserve anymore it's telling us we're looking for God's will and Pope Francis warns against understanding justice I quote against understanding justice as full observance of the law and behaviour in conformity with God's commandments such a vision has led to legalism so you have a rule book and you just check what you're doing by do you meet the rules. Now St. Paul uses the expression righteousness and I find St. Paul is another one of the things I find difficult to understand. And I get, I would be really nervous talking about myself as being righteous because it sounds like the Pharisee from last Sunday's Gospel. Now the man who stood there and said, thank God I'm not like him. <laughs> but to be righteous in Pauline terms means that you try to do just actions, that you try to act justly, and you try to abandon yourself to God's will. And disagreements over what righteousness meant were one of the causes of the Reformation, and we're coming up to 500 years. The Pope is in uh, Sweden next, on Monday, meeting with the Lutheran because it turns out that actually it was an argument about words. We know that we don't deserve salvation. We know that everything we get is a gift of God. And that's what the church split about 500 years ago. Crazy, really. Now, a little advert at this point. Stephen, who does our social media, would be very glad to see Stephen doing an advert. On the Sunday, the 15th of January, at Lace, there will be the Justice and Peace Memorial Lecture. And this year, it's been given by a Dalit, Indian, Lutheran theologian. <laughs> it's the Reverend Raj Bharatpata. He's great. He's a holy man. You know, you talk to him and you feel that you're being blessed. It's wonderful. And... He's a Lutheran, but the, the fact that he's a Dalit, that's the lowest caste in India. And for, Luther had a struggle over power with Rome. And for a, the reason Lutherans are so uh, welcoming to Dalits, it feel, feels good for a, a Dalit to be a Lutheran, because Dalits are the least powerful people in India. They're the bottom caste. They, they clean the toilets with their bare hands. And Luther says, challenge power. So that's why Raj is a Lutheran. I'd be glad to know, I was relieved when I told the archbishop, he said, oh, good. Because <laughs> I thought, thought he might have said, never. <laughs> but he didn't. So the Pope, uh, yeah, the Pope goes on to say that God's justice is his mercy given to everyone. So, we've been offered the certitude of love and new life. What could, now, judgment isn't going to evoke terror. So that there is a divine judge standing there giving you exactly what you deserve. That's cause for terror. But if you're going to get mercy, then we're okay. Because we know that God is on our side, offering us love and new life, offering us what's best for us. So we're looking to do God's will, because that would be the just thing to do. And we know that God wants, he wants what's best for us. And he, God, he, she, God wants what's best for us. God offers us love and wants our happiness. And he doesn't just mean those of us here in this room or just the people in the diocese. He means everybody. Everybody. And that brings
brings us to my working definition of justice. Right relationship. Just two words, like Rolls Royce. Right relationship. And it's a state of mind where we treat our relationships with care. Our relationship with God. With ourselves. With other people. With the world and the rest of creation. And that's why I put this picture of the Trinity. Because this is a painting about relationship. God is relationship. God is Trinity. The relationship, Father, Son, and Spirit. So, is that three angels? Is it the three persons of the Trinity, where the Father points at the Son, the Son points at the Spirit, and the Spirit points to an empty place at the table? And that's for us. Or is it three pilgrims sheltering under the shade of a tree, praying at the holy mountain, going to the ever-open door of heaven, which you see at the top? What if it is? Another angle on relationship comes through Catholic social teaching, commonly called CST. Do you recognize that? Mm -hmm. Solidarity. That's one of the key principles of Catholic social teaching, and the Polish um, shipyard workers call their union, they named it after Catholic social teaching, and that's correct. Solidarity says, we're all in this together. So, if you can think of solidarity as a sort of sideways movement across society that connects us all, so it's sort of linked arms, it doesn't happen in your head, it's an emotion. It's connection of hearts and heads. Because when we're, when we're in solidarity, we're connected to creation. Now, before getting practical, there are, there's two words that I've come across recently. Sorry, three words that I've come across since, since the year of mercy that I want to share with you. Now, I can't read Hebrew, but I'm led to believe that that says hesed. Hesed, which is a Hebrew word for loving kindness and compassion. And in hesed is a sort of male version of love. And it's the doting father looking on his children, and they can do no wrong. This is not the, ju the gaze of a stern judge. This mercy is the kind, the doting father. It's those things. To give generously without counting. And the other word Rakamim is like a female version of God's love. Because this is the love, womb love. The love that a mother has for a baby it carries in its womb, in her womb. And that is such a, such a powerful love. So this is not the mercy of a judge. This is not us being tried and tested and found wanting. This is us being loved, boundless. So there, there's Rakhine. And you know, I was amazed the other day. It's only in the last month this next bit struck me that when we go to Mass, and as we will in a bit, and we say, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, are we asking to be judged? No. We're asking to be loved. Because the Greek translation of mercy is Elios. And from Elios, we get Elias. 
life suffer. So when we say, Lord have mercy, what's the mercy we're asking for? It's the mercy of God as mother and God as father. We're asking to be loved. And now I don't feel so bad about having said that. Then going to the glory and asking for mercy again, and then going to the Agnes Day and asking for mercy again. Because I'm not re repeatedly going on about being judged. I'm going on about being loved. And that, for me, that, that changed things. Now, see Judge Act. This is Joseph Cardine. Joseph Cardine was the man who says, it's always the beginning. Great, great man. Uh, he was a worker priest in Belgium and eventually he founded the YCW and he eventually became a cardinal and he was important at the Vatican Council. And he came up with See Judge Act. Look around, decide what he's doing, good. <laughs> it's great. But Pope Francis has taken up the See Judge Act method. Now, it's such an obvious thing, really, uh, see Judge Jack. We've just got a new fridge, Anna and I. Um, how did we know we needed a new fridge? Well, it was partly because of the puddle of water on the floor. <laughs> partly because the milk had grown lumps. And partly because it stunk, the, the whole fridge. But the light came on, so what's wrong? Can we get it repaired? No, you can't repair all fridges. So, having seen, then you have to go into a judge phase. And we, we do it all the time. So, do we need a big fridge? Do we need a small fridge? Do we need one with AAA rating? Or do we need one with whatever the bottom one? Do we need one that's been bought locally? Do we need one that's come off the internet? So all those sort of practical things that you do when you're making a decision. Now, the Pope now does this. It's now official. Because traditionally, what church teaching is, is that you have a set of rules and doctrine. So you have the rules first, and then you apply them to the situation. See, Judge Jack says you do it another way. Changes the order. Doesn't say there are no rules. But it says you look at the situation carefully first. It's a situation. It's a bit tricky because it's not situation ethics which have been condemned. But it's see, judge, act. Don't do the judgment first. And this was the distinctive method of liberation theology, which was the Vatican thought that liberation theology was a sort of Marxism, that because they thought, well, there were some of the liberationists took up weapons against the government, against oppression. But that wasn't liberation theology, that was frustration. Liberation theology doesn't say take up weapons. And because that's now clear, the way it opened for liberation theology to be reconciled with church teaching. And our Pope is from, he's from South America, he's from the home of liberation theology. And he's a Jesuit. And the Ignatian practice is don't start with the theory, start with the situation, the concrete, what's ha actually happening. So, He's actually discerning the spirits, to use the Ignatian expression. Look at the situation first before you decide what you're going to do. Cardinal Casper, who wrote a beautiful book called Mercy, he says that in Pope Francis' view, quotation starts here, Christian faith is not an ideology that explains everything. It is not a floodlight that illuminates the entire path of our life. Rather, it is like a lantern that shines for us on the path of life as we ourselves are advancing. And there, isn't that the picture that Pope Benedict gave every parish? The, the lantern that shines on our path I'm going to skip a bit there. So, I ask the question, what is the lantern of faith and the lantern of mercy shining in your life 
on your cap at the moment. And it's lit up a few things for me. It's lit up that in Article 14 of that same document, he says, Judge not. If anyone wishes to avoid God's judgment, he should not make himself the judge of his brother or sister. Be generous with others. And then in 15, we look forward to the experience of opening our hearts to those living on the outermost fringes of society. <coughs> fringes which modern society itself creates. How many uncertain and painful situations there are in the world today. How many are the wounds borne by the flesh of those who have no voice because their cry is muffled and drowned out by the indifference of the rich? This is the Pope talking. In Laudato C, and there's a section about water, and the Pope says that the exploitation of the planet has exceeded acceptable limits and we have not solved the problem of poverty. Drinking water is an issue of primary importance since it's indispensable to human life and for supporting terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. He goes on a bit more there. But recently, I saw some photographs from South and Central America that turned those words into a reality, and I'd share them with you. These were taken within the last six months. This is caused by a lack of water. This is this man's livelihood. You can't really see it clearly, but that's a blue mark, and there's another one there, and the blue is iodine. The cow, still alive, look at its ribs. The cow has been painted with iodine to stop the sores spreading. And they get the sores because they're malnourished. How did that man in the previous picture feel? What's that doing to those children? What, how do you feel for that animal? And it's your heart's touched, isn't it? Because mercy begins in the heart. So what we need to do is to make that connection between the heart and the head and the hands that we do something. That is a massive river with a tiny little stream still flowing there. See how big the bridge is to cross it. That's in Honduras. That's in Nicaragua. See the size of the bridge. That's the river there. And another one, Nicaragua. This is the result of climate change. This is what our current way of living has done to the world. Not done it in Liverpool or in Lancashire. But the way we live in the West, they reckon it would take three Earths to sustain the way we live. And we've only got one. And these people are living where life is so difficult that it looks impossible. And it's made worse, of course, by deforestation. It's not just the weather, it's deforestation makes it worse. And why do they deforest? Because they need to sell the wood. And they've also got unstable political systems. But people are ingenious, grinning all over his face, that bloke. He's climbing out of a well. And that's the view. But the deeper the wells go, the lower the water table goes. So they run out of water. And it's impossible to live. So they leave. And when people leave, that's called migration. And when people migrate, they become asylum seekers and refugees. And in the US, at least in Central America, that's led to Donald Trump. <coughs> oh, the next one. It, it mostly touches 
is your heart? What do you do to change things? Now, on the table over there, I don't know if any of you picked them up, there are some three coloured sheets. The white one is a hundred live simply ideas, things you might do. So that's fun still there. Um, refugees. Did you see these pictures? That's Aleppo. Years ago. That's Aleppo today. You wouldn't say it, would you? Did you know that there is compulsory military service in Eritrea? Young men are enlisted. And you think military service, oh, a couple of years, get to survive. No. In Eritrea, compulsory military service for 40 years. Compulsory. And it may not mean military service, it may be down the mines, or it might be in the fields. So they leave. And we call them asylum. pictures of people fleeing from Syria. That's the welcome they got. That's numbers, that's in Hungary. Oh, this one, this is coming over from North Africa. There's the boat. Now, I don't know where the vehicle was that, that took the picture, presumably a plane, but that's one picture, and then a minute later, whether they got picked up or not, I don't know. Uh, our Justice and Peace Assembly last year at Lace, we had a young, we had some stories of asylum seekers, and a young man said, he just wouldn't talk. Well, not surprisingly, really. He said, I was in the fields with my mother and my sister. The plane came. We ran. My mother and sister were killed. I hid in the forest. I went to Libya. I went to France, truncated. I came to England. The police arrested me. I felt safe. talk about the reception to get when you get here, that would take another hour, but I'd be very happy to come and talk to you about, about these issues on another occasion. Did you know 60% of all the asylum seekers who come to the, uh, England are in the northwest, come to the UK, are in the northwest of England, where the housing is cheaper? 60%. 18 of the 19 local authorities in the northwest are now dispersal areas. So, that's the situation. What are we going to do? There's a group of us in Liverpool at the moment, and I'm pretty peripheral to it, really, trying to set up a night shelter for destitute asylum seekers. Ewan at Asylum Link says that, well, Liverpool is a place where people come for the final appeal. If, they, if their appeal is turned down, they're then supposed to leave. Some of them do, some, lots of them don't. Ewan reckons 100 new destitute asylum seekers every year. This has been going on for 16 years. That's the simple size. We're trying to set up a night shelter for 12. 12 destitute asylum seekers. If this is the topic that moves your heart, there's the yellow sheet. I'm telling you to be a teacher. <laughs> the yellow sheet has got some ideas for what you might do. I mean, Anne volunteered at our group in Wigan that does English language classes. Peter and Julia down here run Lazars in Lee. Asylum link, link is brilliant. So if you want to get involved, there are ways of getting involved. And then one last thing before I stop. I've gone on. Uh, just look. There are 65 million refugees worldwide. in the UK. I'm not going to go into that anymore. But this one I want you to 
see, I don't know if you can see the red line there. That is the proportion of asylum seekers in the UK currently, as opposed to the black, which is the rest of the population. We have enough, and yet to read the papers you'd think the world's flooded. <coughs> this is the estimate from a year ago, so it's probably bigger than that, but even if we took everybody from Syria, there's still a lot of black on that pie, the red peaks are small. And as the bottom one, this is the situation in Jordan, which is one of the <coughs> poorest countries, the number of refugees in their population. That's adjacent, so people get there easily. It's just so scary, the way we've hardened our hearts. Food banks, this is the last thing, I've whizzed through this. In our own country, sixth richest country in the world, we have poverty. We have inequality in the UK. It was only the Trussell Trust and a few independent food banks are collecting statistics. The government has no idea how many hungry people there are. It's not interested in collecting. increasing across and Chaz uh, Church Action uh, Church's National Housing Coalition and Housing Justice they're great they'd come and talk if you wanted so the church is, we are involved we're trying but we're not trying hard enough it seems to me anyway if you want to some ideas on how you might get involved, the green sheet on the table.